Okay, this session is called Equipping Others for Multiplication. Okay, um, this is a very important session because uh, you need to know how to multiply yourself and not only become the only person doing this ministry. Okay, remember that uh, the whole point of us doing this training is multiplication. You do not want to be a lone ranger. You do not want to be the only one who is doing this ministry. Remember, you are not ministering as a single fighter. If you do that, it is before uh, a long time, before a period of time, before you will be burnt out. And I think this is the problem with a lot of people who are in ministry. They thought that uh, since they have been given spiritual gifts by God, they have a calling from God, that they need to do everything by themselves. Now, if you do not multiply who you are in this ministry, you are going to feel like the whole burden is upon your shoulder. All the pressure is going to come upon you. But when you do it together as a team, okay, when you do it together with people who are like-minded, people who understand the vision, people who are uh, believe in, 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 in you and people who are working with you on accomplishing the, the vision together, then what you're doing is you are building an army of God. Yeah, so brothers and sisters, I, I want to emphasize this again and again. Okay, this ministry and what we are teaching you is not just simply a method on evangelism. Okay, it's not. Okay, but it is a method for personal multiplication. Okay, by teaching others how to do the same thing that we are doing. Okay, by duplicating ourselves, we can actually help to disciple others to become a mature disciple of Christ who is witnessing, who is discipling others, and who is continuing with the whole process as well. Yeah, remember, we want to build an army. We do not want to be a single fighter and a lone ranger. And the way that we can best glorify God okay, is by abundant, responsible reproduction of disciples. Okay, God is glorified when this work of multiplication is happening in our lives, okay, in the life of our uh, of the people all around us. Okay, and this is uh, one thing that I really appreciate about your pastor, Pastor Ed. However, so many people that we have trained, he is one of the many participants who have grasped this principle. That is a reason why immediately after he has gone through the training, he went back to Baguio and he started to implement this and he started to look for disciples to be trained. And I am really inspired by his commitment to train as many disciples as possible. Okay, there are so many trainings that have been done in order to equip you so that you will go out and do the work. And that is the biblical way of doing it. The right way of doing it is not to uh, sub the whole thing to the professionals. Okay, it's not to okay, and trust the thing to an evangelist since he has the gift of evangelism. Okay, it's not to sub the, the job to the pastor since he's been called to be a pastor. If that is the case, then there will be no multiplication. Then the work will stop okay, the moment that person falls sick or if that person dies. Okay, that is not what God wants. The best way that you can glorify God, okay, and um, this is also in Ephesians 4, okay, Jesus said that he has given us apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, or, or shepherds, and teachers, and evangelists, Okay, he has given us the fivefold ministry not so that we can ask them to do their jobs according to their area of expertise. But these people, they have been called in the office of this fivefold ministry to equip the saints for the work of a ministry. That means every single disciple should be actively doing the work of a ministry. We should be running the work of a fivefold ministry, even though you might not be called to equip others in that specific office. Okay, but all of us are called to make disciples. All of us are called to uh, continue on the pattern. Okay, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, I want to read for you. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul was telling Timothy in this, in this passage, Timothy, all the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust it to reliable people, okay, who will then also be qualified to teach others. 
Now, so there is Paul, the first generation believer. There is Timothy, the second generation disciple. And then you have reliable people. This is the third generation of disciple. And then you have others who are the fourth generation disciples. So we can see here that there is a continuation of the ministry. It doesn't stop with Paul doing everything. If Paul didn't delegate the task, if Paul didn't multiply himself, then we wouldn't have the kingdom of God multiplying so fast all across the world as we know it. Because the work would have died along with Paul. But because he knew the principle of multiplication, he told Timothy, okay, go and multiply. And in the same way today, we are telling you, okay, do not only do this on your own. Okay, you have learned a very simple method that you can easily duplicate by teaching others the same gospel outline. You can take people through the same process that you have gone through. Okay, you do not need to be able to teach in front of a class. You can just take on one or two other disciples and just walk them through. Go out with them on, on the job trainings. Show them how it's done. Okay, and they will be able to observe from how you do it They'll be able to pick things up. They'll be able to catch things from how you do it. And they themselves will be able to witness the way that you do it as well. Okay, so that is the reason why OJT is so important in uh, us doing this. Yeah, because the modeling part is so very important. Okay, and then enlistment principles. I want to share a few with you. Okay, the first one is this. Okay, John 15, if you read from verse 1 to 16, talks a lot about fruitfulness how can we be fruitful as a disciple of christ and then there is this one particular passage where jesus talked about fruit that will remain what do you think it means when jesus say the fruit that will remain well i believe jesus is talking about the reproduction and multiplication principle okay because uh, let me let me explain it this way Soul winning okay, is simply like picking fruits. Okay? So uh, suppose if I invite you to my garden, okay, and I say, okay, you, you feel free to take any of the lemons that you can see. Okay, you can pluck it, and whatever you can pluck, it is yours. Now, it's a very good thing for you because you got free lemons. Okay? But this is addition. Okay, because the moment you go back, the moment you have returned back to your home country in Philippines, you will no longer be able to enjoy lemon, uh, lemon fruits. Yeah, because it is a one-time event. I allow you to pick my fruit, but it is still my garden. Okay, you still need to come to my garden in order to be able to pick them. So similarly, when you go out there and witness as a way of life, yes, you will start to win souls everywhere. But remember, when you win souls, you are picking fruits of other people's labor. Okay, somebody else had sown the seed. Somebody else had watered it. You simply are there to pluck the fruit. You are there to reap the harvest of it. This is not bad, but it is simply addition. Okay, what is the, uh, what is the difference then with multiplication? Training soul winners will be like planting fruit trees in your own garden. It multiplies. Now, suppose if I give you the seed to this lemon, you go back to Philippines and you say, I cannot depend on Brother Nelson all the time to give me lemons. I have an idea what I can do is I can plant this seed in my own garden. And as a result of it, you have this big tree that continue to produce fruits years after years. And that is what we are doing when we are equipping others. You are not simply picking fruits from other people's efforts. But you are, you are uh, uh, cultivating your own garden, okay? Because you are producing a lot of disciples who will continue to produce other disciples, so that the work of multiplication will continue on, even when you stop uh, witnessing, okay? Even when one day when you leave the world, the work of evangelism and discipleship will not stop with your death. It will continue on because of a legacy that you have left behind because of all these disciples who will continue on to make other disciples and that is how it works in the kingdom of God amen so addition 
not multiplication. Turn to the person next to you and say, sorry, uh, uh, turn to the person next to you and say, multiplication, not addition. Okay, the next thing is, you need to know that we only multiply after our own kind. Okay, what do I mean by that? Number one, the quality okay, of the fruit that you are going to produce depends on the spiritual quality of our lives. If you are not a disciple, then you cannot expect to produce a disciple. Isn't that true? A sheep will only be able to give birth to a sheep. Okay? An apple tree will only be able to give birth or, or, or bear fruit to apples. It cannot bear lemon fruits. So in the same way, you will only multiply who you are. If you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you are not a follower, if you are not committed, if you do not follow him, then why do we want to multiply you? <laughs> why do we want two of you? If your quality as a disciple of Christ is not good. That is the reason why one of the things that Jesus was looking for when he picked his first 12 disciples was he looked for readiness to even die for the call that he has called them into. Okay, he is looking for people who are available these 12 disciples, they immediately put down everything and they followed Jesus. And God is now looking for people like that. Okay, because you can only multiply who you are. But the quantity of your fruits will be determined by your passion for witnessing and reproduction. Okay, this is the differences between the two. The quality will be de determined by your spiritual quality of your life, whether you have personal relationship with God, whether you practice spiritual disciplines in your life, but the quantity, okay, the number of fruits that you're going to produce in your life, that is going to be determined by how disciplined you are, by how passionate you are for this ministry of witnessing and multiplication. Okay, I hope that this is clear. Okay, the more passionate you are, the more effort you put into it, obviously, the more fruits that you're going to see in your ministry. Okay, some uh, enlistment procedures. Okay, of course, when you want to uh, enlist others for the similar kind of um, equipping, it is very easy for us, especially if you are a pastor, to just announce it and say, okay, all the full-timers, mandatory, have to join this training. That is the easiest thing to do. Well, what is the pro and cons of such approach? Number one, well, um, when you do that, you raise the awareness about the need to, for evangelism and discipleship. But the downside of that the cons of it is people might be there on the training, but their hearts might not be there. I hope that there isn't anybody like that in this group. Yeah, You are there physically, but your mind is somewhere else. You're thinking about food. You're thinking about your family. You're thinking of other things that you will rather be doing rather than being stuck there, Okay, learning all these things. And at the end of a training, you say, oh, I've gone through the training. It didn't really work for me because your heart is not in it in the first place. Yeah, so the, the best way to enlist new people to be equipped as a disciple is not through broadcast. It's not by public broadcast, but it is by doing it privately. That means you start to scan around to look for people who are disciple material. Okay, Jesus prayed for 12 hours, the entire whole night for 12 disciples. Okay, the, whole, the whole night okay, in its original text is like, about 12 hours. So people, Jesus prayed one hour for his disciple so that when he picked, he'll pick correctly, not like the world, how the world picks. And Jesus approached them privately one by one. And in the same way, when you're enlisting people to be disciple, you need to do that privately as well. Okay? So that is the most effective way. And then approach them personally. You can do it privately, but not personally. What do I mean by that? Okay, now in the era of digitalization, it is so easy for us to just send an invitation through a text message or um, you know, just, just something as simple as a voice message. But uh, it might not have the same effect as if you picked up the phone and called them. If you cannot visit them in person and talk to them face-to-face, -face, at least pick up the call and talk to them directly Okay, in that order. And then if you really cannot talk to them because they're so busy and all that, then you can at least leave a voice message. But text message is the least effective method, in my opinion, 
because it lacks the human touch. Okay, so do it personally. And then also remember to do it prayerfully because you do not have a lot of time to invest on too many people. Our time is limited. Our effort is, is limited. Okay, our, our strength is limited. Our power is limited. You cannot train 1,000 people as much as you want to. You can only focus on a few. And in fact, the, our Lord Jesus, even though he is the Lord himself, he only focused on 12 people. So prayerfully ask God, reveal who are the two or three people that the Lord wants you to equip. Who are the two or three people that he wants you to enlist for the next training? Okay, And who are the two or three people who should go out with you? and doing on the job training with you. That is how you start to multiply. Okay, remember privately, personally, and prayerfully. Okay, the next thing that I want you to know is look for fat people. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, I'm not talking about fat people like that. Okay, <laughs> so fat people means people who are faithful, available, and teachable. Let me explain what that means. People who are faithful means people who will not abandon the process halfway through. You know that when they have started okay, the training or the process of discipleship, they are not going to just simply abandon it halfway through. And they have shown through the track record in the past that uh, they have been faithful to the process. Whenever you ask them to join a training, they will be there. When you ask them to come at a certain time, they will be there on time. Okay, you know that these are people who are faithful, who can be trusted. And the next thing is availability. This is very important. In fact, it is so important that availability is more important than our ability to communicate the gospel. What do I mean by that? Ability to communicate the gospel is something that can be learned. But availability is a matter of the heart. It's an attitude of the heart. Okay, somebody can be very uh, can have a high uh, capability of communication, of communicating the message of a gospel. But it means nothing if that person is always busy all the time. If they always, you know, um, prioritize other things rather than spiritual things. If they are never available whenever you ask them to be equipped, these are not good candidates to be equipped. Yeah, so other than faithful, you want people who are available as well. And finally people who are teachable. Okay, and this is very important because sometimes you might think that a certain person is very smart. They have a lot of spiritual gifts and you think, oh, this is the right person for me to disciple. And only when you have started the process, you find out that, oh, this person's cup is already full. There's nothing new that you can teach this person because they already know everything. Okay, they do not want to hear from you or they always have some comments uh, uh, to show you that they know more than they know better. And it is very difficult for you to disciple somebody like that. Okay, you want to look for people whose cup is empty, people who are willing to unlearn and who, who are willing to humble themselves to see if there's anything that they can learn from this whole process. Okay, so remember the criteria that you are looking for when you are enlisting new disciples will be fat people. Okay, let's repeat together. Fat people, faithful Available, teachable. Okay, one more time. Faithful, available, teachable. Okay, so let's have our radar. Okay, be ready to look for people who are fat. Okay, people who are ready to multiply. Okay, before I move on um, to this last point, um, I want to share something about um, this thing called Bible Discovery Group. Okay, this is something that I've learned uh, recently. Okay, this is how you multiply disciples. You do not only share the gospel and then lead them to faith in Christ and then uh, get them to say the sinner's prayer and then leave them at that. That is not going to get you the disciples that uh, Jesus is looking for. Okay, I've done this in the past, right? Where um, I've led somebody to faith in the Lord get them to say the sinner's prayer. And I felt so joyful, so happy about it. But then two to three months later, I look at this person's life and 
they don't show me any fruits that they are true disciple of Christ. But now what can I do? I cannot go back to them and share the good news with them again because they have already heard the gospel. They've already said the sinner's prayer. And you know, this is something that is scary because in our churches today, especially in modern day churches, we have made the gospel to be something that is so simple, okay, for people to um, understand, something that is so simple for people to respond to the point where we do not challenge them to commit to the call of discipleship anymore. When Jesus started his public ministry, the first word that he said was, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. When he entrusted the same ministry okay, to the disciples, the first word that they said is, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Brothers and sisters, this is so important. When we are when we are leading somebody to faith in the Lord, it is not enough just to lead them into sinner's prayer. And then at the end of that, we say, okay, welcome into the family of God. It is not just about having faith in God. You know, the Bible says in the book of James, even, I, I believe it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's in James 5, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Bible says that even Satan trembles at the name of Jesus. Okay, Jesus, uh, Satan believes that Jesus is Lord. Satan has faith that Jesus is the Savior of the world. But Satan is not safe. Why? Because there is no personal relationship there. There is no repentance there. Okay, so it's very important when we lead somebody to the Lord, we need to emphasize the need for repentance, okay? that they need to be baptized into Christ, that they need to be, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? as you read in Acts 2.38. Okay, then from there on, what is next? How do you make them disciples of Christ? Now in Hebrews 6, if you read Hebrews 6, you will see that there are certain foundation, there are certain basic foundations that a believer needs to have in order for them to be able to grow and mature in their faith in Christ. Okay, things such as repentance, what I talked about earlier, about baptisms, about uh, eternal judgments, and things like that. We need to actually teach them how to do it. And recently, I'm so happy to share with you that I've come across this thing called Bible group discovery. So instead of us leading people into a small group where the leader is doing everything, where the leader is the one who is preaching, where the leader is the one who is uh, leading the worship, where the leader is the one who is serving, and the rest of them just come, and like the rest of you right now listening to me, it's a one-way conversation. This has been the model traditionally for a long time. And instead of that, okay, why don't we change the model a little bit okay, in a small group? Rather than one leader doing everything, we get every member to be actively participating. Okay, in these Bible discovery groups, what they do is they will take eight weeks. They'll get um, people to commit to eight weeks. And uh, each week, they will deal with a different topic. For example, on the first week, it will be topic on repentance, then the next week, you'll be on baptism of water. On the next week, you'll be baptism of the Holy Spirit. The next week, it will be about faith. The next week, it'll be uh, how we need to be a follower of Christ instead of being a disciple. Then another week, it will be about um, the call to follow Jesus, about the need to, um, you know, to heal the sick, cast out demons, just like how Jesus did, uh, asked us to, 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 to preach the gospel and topics such like that. Okay, these are the basics about eternal adjustments and all, all things like that. Okay, because this will set the foundation in that person's life to be a strong, committed disciple of Christ. But you don't see this happening a lot in the modern day churches today because we want instant results. We want people to say the sinner's prayer, get them to come to church once a week, and then we say, okay, you are set for life. You have eternal life. But it is not just about that. Okay, we want to produce disciples. We want to make disciples, not make converts. There is a very big differences between the two. Converts just come to church and at any sign of trouble, any sign of persecution related to their faith, they will check out. But a disciple is somebody who has counted the cost. A disciple is somebody who is ready to follow Jesus no matter what the cost, even if it means their own life. You see, if we are to measure success 
okay, by the modern day uh, criteria of what a successful church is like, you know what the criteria are. You need to have a nice building. You need to have a lot of members in it. You need to have um, a strong financial or a budget for the, for the church. And then you need to have a lot of programs to keep the people inside the church. Okay, if you are to measure the success of a church with these four criteria that I've just mentioned, then Paul would have failed very miserably. Then our Lord Jesus would have failed very miserably because Jesus and the, and the apostles, they didn't have a church building. They didn't have church members. They didn't have all these programs. They didn't have any finances, right? But you look at the fruit of their ministry. It is worldwide. It, it impacted the world as we know it today. Okay, just with 12 simple men. And that is the power of discipleship. It, I'm, I'm very glad that you have a pastor. Okay, pastor Ed, who is very dedicated to discipleship. Discipleship is all about multiplication. But first of all, we have to ask the question, what kind of disciple are we multiplying? If you are a convert, you cannot produce a disciple. First of all, you need to actually have this upward relationship with God. Okay, that means your spiritual disciplines with God. Are you reading your Bible daily? Do you have this prayer lifestyle? Are you following Jesus wholly from your heart? Have you truly repented from your life, uh, from your past life? Okay, have you truly obeyed what Jesus called you to do? Okay, and this is your upward relationship with God. And then there is the inward relationship that we have with one another in a community. This is where in a small group or in a community of believers, where we encourage each other according to the gifts that God has given us, right? There shouldn't be any church member who is passive. We are called to be body of Christ, members of the body of Christ. What do you call, what do you call somebody who has a certain part of, a, of, of the body who is not functioning? A crippled person, right? A paralyzed person. So similarly, in the Church of Christ today, don't you think that there are a lot of paralyzed churches? Because only one pastor or only a few full-timers are doing all the work. The rest of them, they just come passively week after week, listen to the song, and uh, my screen froze for a little while. Can you hear me right, all right now? Okay, sorry about the interruption just now. So a true disciple of Christ is somebody who has a personal relationship with God, first of all. Because what we are leading people into is not a religion. Okay, again, we are not leading people to a religion. We are leading people to a relationship with God. That is very important. And it starts with repentance. Yes, faith is important, but so is repentance. Yeah? So after that, then you bring them into a small group or a community where inwardly we are building up each other. Okay, we are speaking words of encouragement to another. We are ministering to one another according to the gifts that God has given us. Okay, we, are, we are praying for one another. We are loving on one another. And that can only happen in a small group capacity. Okay, as much as I want to, I'm not able to impact your lives as a group like this. I can only do it in a small group setting. That is the reason why Jesus only uh, chose 12 disciples. And he focused on the 12 disciples even though there are times when he ministered to the crowd. Okay, so that is the inward element of discipleship, of community. Then the third one is the outward. The okay, outward call to evangelize and to, minister, uh, and to disciple others. Okay, that is what we've been talking about. Okay, so these three, these three things that I've just mentioned to you are the true call to discipleship. It is not just to win souls and then park them in the church. And then tell them, okay, you just come to church once a week. Make sure you pay your tithes and offering. If you can, join cell group on, on Wednesday. And then if you really have time, please join our prayer meeting. It's not just about attendance. Okay? It's about living out your Christian faith. And in these Bible discovery groups, okay, um, there is these simple cards. Okay? I, I will share the cards with uh, Pastor Ed for those of you who are interested. I will, I will send it to Pastor Ed and he can forward it to you. It's a very simple 
Bible study method where we get the new believers to come in a small group and commit their time for eight weeks where we're going to cover these eight topics that I've just mentioned to you earlier. Okay, and instead of the leader doing everything, the leader only asks three questions. Okay, so the members are learning themselves and they are teaching one another. The first question you ask is, from this passage, what can you learn about God? The second question is, from this passage, what can you learn about man? The third question is, is there something that you need to obey or do after reading this passage? Very simple. Anyone can do that. Anyone can lead a group like that. So the facilitator doesn't need to have a lot of Bible knowledge to lead a group because the teacher is not the leader anymore. The teacher is the Holy Spirit himself. And when you do a group like that, let me tell you, multiplication is going to happen. Okay, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I joined the Luke 10 school that is started by a man called Torben Sudengard, and it is now becoming a movement. Okay, these are a group of people who are living out the faith just like in the early church, just like in the New Testament. Okay, they are not only having a, a personal relationship with God through their spiritual disciplines, but they meet regularly for groups like this that I talked I, I talk to you about. They are discipling each other. They are teaching each other the word of God. And then they are also going out to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to, to preach the gospel, leading people to Christ, calling people to repentance. They are doing all this. And you know, when... Everybody, every member is active. Do you know that in a short half a year, their group grew from 40 groups to 200 groups? 400% increase. I long to hear the same thing happen in Baguio City. I mean, where it is not a program, where it is not building the church systems or the church structure, but we are truly building the kingdom of God so that people everywhere will start to respond to the gospel and they will be discipled and they will have the strong foundation. They'll have the right foundation and they are going to multiply everywhere for the glory of God. And I believe that that can happen in Baguio City through all of you. Amen? Upward relationship with God, inward relationship with one another, and an outward call to evangelize and to disciple. Okay, so I hope that you have uh, learned from that. So these three things shouldn't be, be neglected when we are discipling others, okay? So again, I will send the cards to Pastor Ed and uh, he will find a way how to send it to uh, forward that card to those of you who are interested, okay? Just by asking these questions, you can start a small group wherever you are. Okay, remember once again, before I move on to the next point, we are not okay, building... Uh, the church, because it's Jesus' job to build his church. We are called to make disciples. Okay, We are called to build the kingdom of God. Okay, Remember, we are leading people into a relationship and the kingdom of God and not religion and rituals. Okay, so my last point for today is this. Pattern for duplication. Okay, this is the last point uh, that you need to understand in order for you to equip others for multiplication effectively. The first one is the importance of modeling. Now, why do you think churches all around the world, pastors all around the world, have been preaching from Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, about the Great Commission? Various numbers, uncountable okay, a number of sermons have been preached on this topic. Okay uncountable number of training programs on evangelism and discipleship have been done. But yet, people still stay in the comfort of a church. People still do not go out and evangelize and disciple. What do you think is the missing link? What do you think is the missing factor why people are not doing what they know? Because, you know, knowing something in your head doesn't mean that you will practice it. Doesn't mean that you have internalized it and doesn't mean that you know how to do it practically when you're out there in the field. That is the reason why modeling is so important. And this is the missing link in a lot of churches today. Yes, the pastors told them, go out there and evangelize. Go out there and witness. Go out there and make disciples. 
But the people are asking, how do I do that? <laughs> you cannot do something that you have not seen being modeled. Let me give you an analogy. If I want to teach you how to swim, it's not enough for me to go through like a, a whole week of, of swimming lessons theoretically for me to give you instruction on how to swim, on all the different styles of how to swim. And then on the day, I just throw you into the deep end of the pool and I say, remember chapter seven, page 201. Do you think that will help you at all? If you're learning how to swim and I never show you how to swim, you're going to drown to death. And even if you remember what chapter seven, page 201 is, you will still drown. Because that is not the way how learning is supposed to be done. Okay, The right way how it should be done is modeling. Jesus did this with his 12 disciples. The early church did this in order to multiply the next generation of disciples and for us to be effective in this ministry. This is what we need to do as well. We need to model to others what we want to see them doing in the future. That is a reason why you need to witness as a way of life first before you equip others. Otherwise, what kind of disciple are you multiplying? Okay, so that is the reason why on-the-job trainings is so very important. Now, I know that during pandemic time, doing an in-person on-the-job training is um, challenging, but that is where we are so grateful for tools and for platforms like Zoom, okay, where we are able to meet up with people digitally like this, even though I'm in a different country, I'm able to equip you Okay, internationally, okay, and distance is not a problem because of uh, technology. So you can do that in a small group. Show your um, participants or your trainees how to share the gospel effectively. The first time you do it, you do 100%. They witness how you do it. They learn from you. They observe you. They catch it from you. And then the next, the next time you go out again, you bring the same participants you say, you do this part, I'll do that part. Okay, And then if that person gets into trouble, you come in and help. And then the third time when you go out for OJT, the new trainee will do it 100%. And you just supervised it from a distance. Okay, This is how modeling process works. It has to be simple. It has to be replicable. And it has to be supervised okay, for the whole process to be duplicable. Okay, and we are so grateful that in EE, we have learned a simple method that we can teach to others. It is very replicable because wherever you are in the world, if you just follow the systems, you can achieve the same results. And then the third point is supervise. Okay, you don't just teach it to somebody else and then you leave them alone. No, this is where discipleship comes in. You need to be like a parent figure to that person. You need to, to be like a... Uh, an authoritative figure where you are coming in as somebody who mentors them, okay, until they get it, okay, until they catch it. Remember, evangelism is not something that is taught, it is something that is caught. Okay, that is why on the job training is a must. Okay, there is no um, compromise on this. Without on the job training, this whole thing is not going to work. And finally, for duplication to happen, there needs to be a clear standard to follow. Now, what do I mean by that? Why is Coca-Cola, why is McDonald's, KFC, so successful all around the world? Jollibee in, in Philippines. Why is it so successful all over the Philippines? Because there is a clear standard to follow. Can you imagine if Coca-Cola tastes differently in different countries? Do you think Coca-Cola will be as successful as it is today? If McDonald's tastes different in different parts of the world, do you think it will be as successful as it is today? If the systems how to run McDonald's, KFC, Jollibee is different in one place than the other, do you think it will be as successful as it is today? Definitely not. And that is what strong multiplication is all about. There is a successful pattern that you need to model and then you just follow that clear standard. All right, so in the same way, when you are discipling these new believers or your disciples, remember to keep the pattern. Okay, the same way that Paul told Timothy, what you have seen me do, teach the same thing 
to reliable people who be able to teach others also in the same way, whatever you have learned from us. Do the same thing. Pattern the same thing. Okay? And duplicate yourself. Okay? That is the reason why there's a clear standard to follow. Some people, they don't like memorizing, right? The M-E-E-E. -E -E. They're like, oh, why do I have to memorize? Okay, why can't I just uh, go freestyle, use my own way of doing it? No, because if you go freestyle, your trainees, your disciples are going to be confused. Okay, they are going to follow something else and there won't be multiplication. That is a reason why it is important for us to follow the standard. Yeah, so bear with us, even there are times when you feel like you don't understand why you have to do certain things. Okay, so I've come to the end of the, this session, this training. And I just want to um, give you these blessings, you know, from Galatians 6, 9, and to encourage you. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Brothers and sisters, there is a huge harvest that's waiting for us right now. Okay, people are dying everywhere. Okay, people are dying not only physically, but spiritually. People are drowning. Okay, what are we going to do about it? Do not become wary. I know that this is a challenging time. I know that this is a time when we ourselves have a lot of needs. But if we do not become wary in doing the work of ministry that the Lord has entrusted to us, at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. We're going to see multitudes of souls being led into the kingdom of God everywhere. In, King, in Baguio City. Amen? And not only that, I believe that it's going to spread all around, all over Philippines until Philippines is filled with the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is next from here? Okay, what is next after this training? Form teams. Schedule an OJT experience. Okay, this is the first thing that you need to do. Okay? I, I'm not sure if you right now work in teams already, if you've been divided into teams. I believe that you have. Go out with the same team, okay? Schedule an on-the-job experience. If you cannot do it in person, schedule a, a Zoom meeting with your friend, invite them over. If there is one thing that a lot of us uh, uh, have in common during this pandemic period is during the lockdown period, a lot of people have a lot of time and they do not know what to do with those times. Well, this is a good time for you to call them and build friendship with them and start to find out about what's happening in their life and then schedule a time for you to actually share the gospel with them when the door is already open for them. Okay, so remember, it's not something that you only need to do, uh, that you can only do in person. You can also do it through Zoom digitally. Okay, you can do it through the phone as well. Okay, and keep practicing the gospel stories and presentation that you've learned. Okay, sharpen it again and again. And keep witnessing as a lifestyle. Remember, it's not a program, okay, but it is a lifestyle to be followed. And finally, be upgraded to become trainers. Okay, I believe that in the future, Pastor Ed will uh, give out trainings, how to train you to become next level trainers. Remember, this is, a, this is a method of multiplication, not only a method of evangelism. That means one day, just like your trainers, we want you to also be able to train others. Yeah, so attend the next multiplication workshop that Pastor Ed is going to uh, roll out. Okay, don't stop here. With being able to witness is just the first step. The next step is you must know how to be able to train others to do the same. Okay, and then to facilitate a group like this. Some of you have ability to teach, to facilitate. Use that for the glory of God. Yeah, so continue on uh, with the next level trainings. Stop here. This is only the beginning, not the end. And finally, brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you with this question. What could be possible for our community in Baguio City, wherever you are from, if we all take this call to be fisher of men seriously? Can you imagine if we start to be a witness wherever we are? If we start to make disciples everywhere that we go, just like how what Jesus commanded us to do, we will start to be the salt and light of our Lord Jesus everywhere we go. The darker the time, yeah, the darker the time, the brighter our light will shine. 
the more the world will see that we have the answer to the problems that they have right now. The more that we can do this and be serious and focus on discipleship and the Great Commission, the more the world will want the hope of glory that we have in us. Brothers and sisters, the time is short. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is coming back very soon for his bride. We don't have much time to spare. Will we focus on the task at hand that he has entrusted to us? Or are we still busy with our own agenda? Are we still busy with our own life? I hope that that is not the case. You see, I would like to close with this picture. There are two types of church that we can build. The first type is the cruise ship kind of church. Again, many people of the world, they opt for this type of church where they focus most of their effort, their money, and their attention to build a beautiful state-of-the-art facilities and building that they call church. And they fill it with so many programs, so many exciting events to get people to come, to enjoy, and to have parties so that what people will not never leave the four buildings so that they can have a huge congregation, number of congregations to boast about. And it's so comfortable that the people in it forget that we have not been called to party here on earth. The party is going to come, but it's not here. The party is going to happen when we are in the presence of Jesus in heaven. There is going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb waiting for us, but it is not now. Now is the time for us to go out there and be like the second type of church, the rescue boat church, okay, where you go out, and you know that there are people who are spiritually dying everywhere and where you understand that it is your job to act as a bridge between those drowning people and God. Brothers and sisters, the, 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 the word of the Lord tell us so clearly that we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us so that people everywhere will be reconciled with him. You are an ambassador of God. You have been called to represent him and his kingdom here on earth. And there are people all around you who need to hear the good news from you. There are people all around you who needs to be discipled by you. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to join Jesus' army to build a team, to build an army of God for his glory? Or are you going to just enjoy your stay here on earth as if our church is a cruise ship? I'll leave that to you. And let me pray for you in ending uh, my session with you today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for all these disciples of Christ who have been faithful, Father. They have given their lives. They have given their hearts, Lord, for the call of this ministry to go and make disciples, to baptize people in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that you have commanded us. And dear Lord Jesus, you have promised that you will be with us till the end of age. You have not left us alone with this task. You've entrusted it to us, but you have promised that you will be with us as we go out obediently and carry it out. I pray, Father, that through all these brothers and sisters in this place, even though I do not meet them in person, even though we are separated by distance and by the seas, I pray, O oh Lord, for fruits to start to be produced in their lives. The Lord, you will start to show them the people of peace all around them who need to hear the gospel. People all around them who need to be discipled to maturity. And for that to happen, I pray for heart transformation to first happen in us first because we only multiply who we are. And I pray that every single one of us will grow in maturity in their knowledge of you. And only then, Lord, will they be able to multiply, Lord, uh, disciples everywhere for the glory of your name. I pray for Pastor Ed, Lord, that you will bless him. You anoint him, Father, as the leader, Lord, of this movement. We believe that Baguio has been washed by the blood of Jesus and many multitude of souls will be won for the glory of God. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Ready, go. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. God bless you.
I love all of you. I, I can't hear you really well because of uh, soft audio, but I think you are saying you are asking me to come over there and visit you all sometime in the future. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, sometime in the future, whenever it's safe. Definitely. Definitely. I already miss all of you over there. Amen. Thank you. I look forward to see that flower festival that you've been telling me about. Thank you so much, brother. Now, so say hi to Mr. AV and the kids. Okay. Before I go, um, maybe I'll just like to give opportunity, maybe um, one or two questions that any of you might have. I'll be happy to answer them and uh, fellowship a little bit before we end our session. Yes. Anyone can, do you have questions? Do you want to ask brother Nelson? Do you want to 